This might be the first EOS phone camera I've tested that I can't recommend almost under any circumstance. Today I'm going to review the EOS 630. This EOS 630 was um, the third autofocus SLR that Canon produced under this EOS um, line. It uh, was released in 1989 and discontinued in 1991. Even for this time, it was a relatively short shelf life of production. And I think once you understand some of the uh, pros and cons of the camera, it might become clear why this wasn't made for a very long time. Unlike some of my other videos, we'll go through the positives of this camera first, and then we'll go through the negatives, including one of them, which is a deal breaker for me. Okay, so things to like about this camera. It has a really good build quality. Um, a decent part of the body is metal. Um, with a bit of plastic mixed in. But overall, this has one of the better feels to it of any of the uh, early prosumer or consumer EOS film camera line, uh, line of cameras. It has a good weight to it. Um, I don't, preferably I don't like my cameras to be too light, um, but too heavy can get cumbersome as well. It has a really good viewfinder. It's a decent size. It doesn't feel like you're straining your eyes to see the frame or to understand what you're, uh, what's in focus and whatnot. It has a pentaprism, so that means it helps the viewfinder itself be very clear and bright. It has interchangeable focus screens, which is always a cool feature for some of these cameras. Um, so you can get different sort of frame guidelines in, in, the, uh, in the viewfinder. Although it doesn't have spot metering, the partial metering is a very small area, 6.5%, um, which is good considering a lot of the partial metering uh, measurements from uh, these cameras of that era were about 9%. So in like the advertisements for this camera said back in the day, you had a small partial metering and you had a full frame evaluative metering option. So they would, they, Canada would say you could meter from 100% of the frame down to 6.5% of the frame. So that range just between those two metering options gives some good flexibility with metering. Of course, the camera is uh, auto load capable. So you can put the film in the back, drag the film to the orange indicator and close the back door and it loads automatically which by this point, this was pretty standard for film cameras, but it's still worthy um, to note because if you're just getting into film photography, some of the cameras you might be considering buying are manual cameras, mechanical cameras that uh, don't have auto load features. So auto loading is a, a convenience that um, can, can be handy when you're, when you're out shooting and you wanna move fairly quick and you don't have to worry about um, making sure you load the, the film correctly. Another cool positive is that it has a nice size LED panel on top of the camera. Um, some cameras like the Rebel line has a, a smaller screen so either it doesn't show as much information or the information does show. It does show is smaller. This one has a nice size LED panel on top which is really handy. This can be nice to shoot with uh, there are some elements of it that feel familiar, but overall that's where the positives for this camera end. And now I'll get into the negatives because this is unique in terms of comparing this to the other cameras I've tested so far and some of the other cameras that I've tested but not shot videos for. This is the only one where I don't think I'll have any need to shoot with it again. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't really particularly like this camera when in terms of actually using it. So let's get started with the negatives and I'll explain why. The first thing I noticed was these buttons on the back here, which uh, I like to turn one of them into the autofocus button. But those buttons on the back are really small and it's not super easy just to put your thumb up there and operate them. They're kind of, they're small and they're also recessed a little bit inside the body itself. So those buttons are not easily accessible. Um, some of the other negatives are common to some of the consumer film EOS cameras at this time. Um, no spot metering, which I already mentioned, not a big deal. Uh, 
if that's one of the only negatives that it would have, then that would not be a big deal. It maxes out at one two thousandth shutter speed, which again, for the consumer cameras, this was standard. Um, one of the biggest negatives that uh, really slowed me down in terms of operation was that there was no autofocus point to light up when you had the focus locked on. With cameras such as the EOS 1, EOS 1N, EOS 3, and countless others, whether you chose which autofocus point it was going to use or whether you let the camera choose, that autofocus point would light up when it locked focus with that point. It letting you know what focus point was used, also letting you know, giving you visual feedback that you have focus, it's locked in. There's no visual feedback for this other than you can assume that it's in focus based off of just your eye, but the whole point of using autofocus is to get that help from the camera to, to lock it in. So no visual feedback for autofocus. That's one of the features where uh, I wouldn't want to give up if I have another camera available that has that. Another big negative that slowed my operation down when using this camera is there's no exposure scale. But not only that, there's no easy way to know if you're locked on exposure or not when you're in manual mode. Um, you can find that out by pressing this M button on the side of the camera body. It will show you whether you are underexposed or overexposed or locked on when you have that button pressed. If you're adjusting shutter speed or aperture, you don't get instant feedback whether you're locked on with your exposure or not. When you have that button pushed, you will get feedback on whether you're underexposed, overexposed, or locked on with your exposure. But not having any sort of plus or minus that's constantly on or exposure scale that's constantly on um, just makes it so you're having to do a little more work just to make sure that you're on exp that, that your exposure is locked on. I could stop there with all the negatives and that those alone would make me choose almost every other camera I have over this one, including the Rebel G, which is the $15 camera I've talked about before. At least with that one, with just learning a couple of the oddities about it, I feel like I can, I can pick it up and go really with, without skipping too much of a beat. This one I can't. Uh, you compare it to any one of those other film cameras, it's gonna, some one of those other film cameras are gonna be better in a couple aspects or all the, all, all the aspects that we're comparing here. So let's get to the big negative of this camera that to me is a deal breaker. It's one negative that's been talked about on YouTube a few times and it's also been talked about in other blogs and websites as well. And it's also one, another one of those things where I may have read about this a few years ago, but I never owned the camera, so I never had to worry about it or think about it. And then when I got it and experienced it, then it hit me. Oh yeah, now I remember this was a problem with this camera. So what is that problem? Well, basically it's a battery drain issue. If you leave a battery in the camera, even if it's off, the camera can drain the battery dead in a short amount of time. This happened to me because again, I forgot about it, left the battery in there, and then came back and checked and the battery was dead. And then as soon as I checked it and as soon as I saw that the battery was dead, I remembered, oh yeah, that's, that's a problem and this is the model of camera that has that problem. It's not worth it for me to shoot with this camera because of that combined with everything else that I talked about on the negative list. There are fixes out there for the battery drain issue. I'm not even sure what they are um, because to me, again, there's not, um, there's not a lot of reason to dig that far into it to fix it. If you have this camera already, um, well, for one, you may already know this issue and you may have a way around it or you fixed it already. If you want to fix it, there are video uh, videos out there that show you how. I will link to some in the description because um, I have not tried to, to fix this yet. I will say if you own this camera and don't want to fix, fix it by digging into the camera itself, I suggest just pulling the battery out when you're done shooting and putting it back in when you go out to shoot. It sounds obvious, but it's something you don't have to do with every other film camera that I own. Um, I can leave batteries in and as long as they're turned off, nothing in the camera will drain the battery that quickly. Um, so this one was, this was a little bit of a downer because I wanted this to be like some of the other EOS film cameras I tried where 
um, you're willing to forgive some of the shortcomings because of the um, the time frame of when it came out, understanding that this was just the way of the world at that time with film cameras. But this one has just a little too much on the negative side for me. Um, and if I'm going out to look for a film camera today, I'm skipping right over this one. So yeah, basically taking everything into account, the positives on this camera do not outweigh the negatives. And again, that's unique for the film series from, from the Canon EOS line. Like I've said in other videos, videos before, almost every EOS film camera has more positives than negatives because you take everything into consideration, including the price, the, 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 the camera that you're getting for the money, and what you can do with it. But since this one would take so much work to make it operate normally, to make it not drain your batteries, to learn the oddities and how to work it, all those negatives add up to make it just not worth it if you have the choice to avoid it. Um, if you're just jumping into the uh, film camera world and you're looking at some of these EOS film cameras, start with a Rebel G or Rebel 2000 or, or go up a little bit to the anything from the Elon series would be great cameras. Um, the EOS 1 or EOS 1N are obviously some of the top of the line cameras. Um, the top of the line is probably the EOS 3 and the EOS 1V. Um, but any of those choices are amazing and uh, you can't go wrong with those. But if, but if you are starting out right now shopping for cameras, I cannot recommend this US 630, unfortunately. The good thing is I do not regret getting it to try it. Um, I was curious about this camera just like I was curious about the Rebel G. And it's, uh, it's always interesting to, 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 to learn the differences in, in each one of these cameras because you will see these on the used market quite a bit. And if you do get this for dirt cheap or someone gives it to you, then like I said, the first thing I would do is just get into the habit of only putting the battery in when you're ready to go out to shoot. Um, these batteries are not cheap. Even on Amazon, which is pretty much the cheapest place to get them, you're looking at about eight bucks a battery or so. For a camera that eats batteries, that becomes a pretty expensive camera. Uh, so, but if you do get this camera, learn to pull the battery out like, you know, um, like clockwork or find those videos on how to fix it and dive in and give it a shot but it has to be worth it for you and that's only uh, only you can decide that um, I suggest go to usephotopro.com or keh.com and just keep a hawk eye on the used film camera lineups that they have and there are usually plenty of choices there at great prices that can get you started for um, not much more, if not cheaper, than what this camera would go for. So that's pretty much it for the EOS 630 in my review of it. Unfortunately, this camera is a cannot recommend from me. I'm not even sure what I'll do with this one. I could try to sell it, but again, um, they don't go for much. So I may just keep it because it does represent the earliest design of the EOS film camera lineup. So in that regard, for a collector, collector's piece, it's cool and I like it for that. Um, so I probably will keep it for archival purposes, so to speak. Um, but I will move on to other film cameras. And I have a few more I have not talked about yet on video, which I'm excited to because one of them is my current favorite film camera, the EOS 3. So please like and subscribe. Hit the bell if you if you if you are liking more than one of these videos, then hopefully you're going to like more to come.